Now we are starting with a short conversation. I would like Yumi to come on the stage with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to have you here. And then Hans Ulrich Oberist, uh, obviously the mastermind of this institution. Thank you. Big round of applause for Hans Ulrich. And then Tokwasse, Tokwasse Dyson. And everybody needs to see her exhibition, the inaugurating exhibition of the new Pace Gallery space here in London. It's a breathtaking exhibition. But about breath is also the installation, the sound installation that Tokwase developed for this pavilion and that you can listen to every day in the next uh, week at least. Uh, and this is a communion also, a collaboration between her and Sumaya. Sumaya, please come to the stage also. Big round of applause for Sumaya Bali. We wouldn't be here without her. And now I'm giving the word to Yumi and I thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you. Can we have another round of applause for Mikolai, please? Thank you. Thank you very much for your brilliant introduction. He's actually done a lot of my job, <laughs> so I'm very grateful. <laughs> I was getting ready to introduce our excellent panelists, but that's been done now. Um, I, no, 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 I'm very happy you did it. <laughs> um, I hope everyone is happy, excited, thrilled as I am about this evening's events. I hope you're not too cold. And if you are, I hope that you're warmed by what I hope will be an excellent conversation today. Um, I'm going to dive straight in, as I know that we are quite short on time. So let's begin with the lady of the hour, Sumaya. The pavilion's design is based on past and present places of meeting, organising and belonging across several London neighbourhoods, significant to diasporic and cross-cultural communities. Could you tell me a little bit more about those influences and how they've inspired the pavilion, but also the project more broadly? Thank you so much um, for this warm welcome, everyone, and also for this beautiful question. Uh, the pavilion has been inspired, as you said, by places that have been important to communities. Um, in, in a sense, I was really interested in how people construct home and construct belonging when they move to a new city. And so I worked with waves of migrations in London, and of course we know that's the story of all of London. But I was particularly inspired by places that became important to this construction of home in the city. And so I looked at many of the first mosques, the first African churches, synagogues, um, places where people could find recipe or traditional ingredients important to recipes. Um, so marketplaces became really important to look at, uh, but then also cinema where someone could listen to something in their mother tongue, watch something in their mother tongue. Um, how the ways that people were able to access geographies from far away in London became really important. And many of these spaces were very small, but they were hugely impactful in that they allowed communities to come together and construct and evolve and assert their identities and their forms of belonging in the city. And so many of them also birthed huge cultural movements like the Notting Hill Carnival, the headquarters for the West Indian Gazette, um, some of the first calypsos, uh, publishing houses which became really central to uh, UK literature. Um, many, many of these were born from very small, relatively unknown, humble places. And I wanted to be able to honour these places, as you said, past and present. Um, and so th these were the spaces that I worked with in developing the forms in the pavilion. But as important as it was to fold these places into the pavilion, it was also really important to be able to fold the pavilion back out into London. And so there are fragments of the pavilion located in neighbourhoods in London where we've been able to develop a deeper, more meaningful relationship with some of these spaces of belonging. Thank you so much, Maya. Yeah, give that a round of applause. We're going to be touching on some more of those themes in a moment, but I'm just going to take it now to you, Hans. Um, the pavilion is unique for many reasons. Um, one of the major reasons at the moment is that this one in particular has existed through a global pandemic. Um, how would you say that has shaped your personal 
as well as the public's experience and understanding of the spaces that Sumaya has created. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this question and uh, thank you all for being here. Actually, uh, I think the pavilion, one thing which has always been key with the pavilion, it started in 2000 with Zaha Hadid, is something the late Edouard Glisson once told me and I actually found this quote this morning where uh, he told me that if we look at the places in which exhibitions are traditionally presented, these are invisible to large sections of society. And he said, you know, we actually need to think about other forms of engagement and new models of exhibitions that are more mobile and can go to the people. And I think that quote of Glissant really summarizes very much this experience, no? because in a way, first of all, as you can see, there are no doors with the pavilion. So that means many people, they just encounter it by chance, no? on a walk, when they come to the park. And there can be uh, encounters with people who never would have visited maybe an exhibition of architecture otherwise. But of course, Sumaya, uh, th and that has always been the case with the pavilion from the very beginning. I mean, uh, when Tim Berners-Lee said in 1989, the World Wide Web, no, this is for everyone. That's very much about the pavilion. It's always been there for everyone. Uh, it's in that sense a very free open structure. But Sumaya took it to the next level, really, and uh, took it to the next level because for the first time, and it's in that sense very Glissantian, the pavilion not only invites everybody to come here to Kensington Gardens and see it and experience it, but actually Sumaya took the pavilion to the people, to many different communities. As you could hear from Sumaya, the inspiration came from these communities, but then there were islands, little islands in a way, of uh, the pavilion which physically appeared in these communities are also going to stay there. Yeah, there's almost like a gift, right, Sumaya gave to these communities. Um, and I would say that is a kind of a Glissantian archipelago. It's not this idea, you know, of a continental structure, uh, but it's a, an archipelago which is, which is more generous. Thank you so much, Hans. Sumaya, I'm going to take this back to you. So the social and architectural infrastructures of a city are supposed to, in an ideal world, relate well to one another. What would you say has been, you know, going wrong and how can we ensure that communities, especially marginalised communities, are centred as we move forward? Um, I think, in a way, my, my response is centred in your question because we've, uh, we've forgotten or there's a lack of acknowledgement about how intertwined architecture and social forces are, and architecture is a crystallization of social forces. So, so seeing a misalignment between the two is not really a misalignment, but actually that architecture for the most part in, in most cities and places in the world has been used um, as a force for separating people. But I think in being able to understand that, especially as a South African, who comes from a city in which there's a history of the segregation and of a kind of weaponization of architecture, uh, we also have to see and understand that architecture absolutely can be used as a force for the opposite, as a force for gathering and for bringing people together. But I think that at the heart of this understanding is the understanding that architecture is intertwined with social forces, whether we acknowledge how politicized it is or not, it always falls within a set of politics. And I think being able to have more of an awareness about that without merely falling into the status quo or perpetuating sets of politics that we might not necessarily even believe in, for me, is a way forward. To be able to be more conscious about the intent and the level of responsibility that we hold as architects, as spatial practitioners, as creatives, um, and as people who exist in this world, we all also carry with us sets of politics. Um, and to use that agency as powerfully as we can um, through the intents in our work is, is for me much, yeah, it's much more needed. Thank you, Smile. To Kwase, acceptance, seeing and being seen informs your work for the pavilion. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to the project and the imperative in a functioning society? That's interesting, the imperative in a functioning society. <laughs> I like the fact you're taking your time to think. <laughs> it's what I would do with a question like that. <laughs> 
Well, I think that that brings up the issue of utopia and a center. And maybe the imperative in a functioning to society is to realize even when things are separate or fragmented or, oh, oh, mm, I'll say, compartmentalized and not connected, that just because you're not connected to something else doesn't mean that that place doesn't have its own center, right? Maybe the idea of autonomy and semi-autonomy has respect and what then has respect, and I'm talking about respect for otherness, right? And then building, if you, if you then build connections um, that sort of create networks is to create those through ways with gentility and um, without harm. So maybe that's a functioning society to respect autonomy semi-autonomy and to create through ways that are without harm. That's the kind of answer you get when you think about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was excellent. I want to I want to open this question out to all of you. I'm going to start with you, Samaya. What are you hoping the legacy of this project can and will be? Um, well, we're very lucky, I think. I'm very lucky to have been able to work with the Serpentine and with the support of all of our partners, many of them here tonight. Thank you, Terme. Um, to develop the program called Support Structures for Support Structures, which is an initiative that works to support um, up to 10 artists and, in, and collectives a year working at the intersection of art and social justice, art and the archive, and art and ecology, all themes that the pavilion is really interested in. And we're hoping that through this initiative, which will grow and evolve and build year on year, that we also work to start to seed, support and develop new bodies of knowledge or, or s support different bodies of knowledge which are operating in the arts. Um, and I think it's allowed this time and space that the pandemic has given us, has also allowed us to reflect on the role of institutions in London and the role of ourselves finding finding ourselves in a position of agency in the city. Um, and that's one of, I hope, many, um, many things that have developed out of this pavilion, but there have been several others. The islands that Hans Ulrich mentioned, um, which are being held at the moment by the incredible curators at the Serpentine, Natalia Grabowska and Amal Khalaf are doing really incredible work. Natalia just told me that she's just come from Barking and Dagenham. And we're working on, on collaborations in these neighborhoods that hopefully will also continue beyond the life of the pavilion. Um, and it's also, in a way, shifted my practice incredibly. I've, able, I've been able to be based in London more. Hopefully, I have lots of work that's developing with many of these communities and many of these spaces. Um, and yeah, I, I, in a, I hope that somehow the seeds of this pavilion continue in many forms beyond what we can imagine or see right now also. Thank you so much, Hans. Yeah, I mean, Sumaya summarized it so, so beautifully. I think, in a way, it's about long duration. And this process has been a collaboration of two, more than two years, two and a half years. Um, with Sumaya, and I think the extraordinary thing is that for the first time, the architect actually moved to London and now lives in London. Sumaya spent almost a year in London, and as we discussed earlier, I think Mikolai mentioned it also the idea of listening you know, to, the, to the city, and Etelatnan always tells us we need to learn to listen and listen more, and that the pavilion has so much to do with, uh, with listening. So I think, in a way, um, it is a long duration process and uh, project and it's of course this structure is uh, coming down at the end of the week and will then uh, reappear somewhere else but I think it's always going to be here because many of the things Sumaya has implemented, the support structure scheme will continue, uh, the idea of the archipelago, it's of course also going to be really interesting to see how the next architects in the future years are going to pick up on that. Uh, we are very excited to work with the Astor Gates on, uh, on next year's pavilion and uh, I'm sure that he will continue you know, this thread of thinking. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's important that, and that's also something I think um, in terms of the last 18 months, that it's really important that we think more about 
long durational projects that we think about. It's not about event culture. It's about how we can actually go beyond this idea of event culture and do things uh, which have, are more sustainable. No, I mean, Roman Kachanik wrote this wonderful book, How to Be a Good Ancestor. Uh, and I think we can learn from that. And hopefully, Sumaya is, yeah, is somehow showing us the way in many ways. And I think the last point, I hope, is that, of course, this idea of almost doing urbanism by really working with the city uh, and creating these magnets, no? Because Sumaya created these islands, which are also magnets, um, is something which can happen not only with the pavilion, but can hopefully also happen more with exhibitions. And it actually did already start when we had the exhibition of Arthur Jaffa. I always remember about three or four years ago, um, Arthur Jaffa said, you know, he really doesn't want to show everything here. And he wanted to build a tent, uh, a structure, and then show the films in different communities in London who otherwise wouldn't see them. So I hope that we can pick up this archipelago idea uh, of Sumaya, of Arthur Jaffa, and do also exhibitions which are going to be archipelagos. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Anne. So, Kwasa, is there anything that you'd like to add to that question? What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what are you hoping the legacy of this project can be? The legacy of this question? Uh, well, I guess, um, on a sort of personal note, I guess friendships, right? So I think that um, what, <laughs> what Samaya has created um, gives us opportunities and a lot of us opportunities to think about sound as architecture. And so, um, so that's one thing, friendship, sound as architecture, um, which I have tapped into. But on an even pers more personal level, I think um, I, I put in the sound piece, I added my mother's voice. So my mother is 73 and she started taking singing lessons. And um, she sent me this song called The Rose. Do you all know Bette Midler's The Rose? You know that song? It's pretty incredible. So uh, what came out of that was the opportunity for me to hear my mother sing in this pavilion, which was epic. So that's something personal and deep, and I think it's the best gift I've ever been given by her. And Sumaya allowed me the opportunity to experience, in the round, experience that in the round. It's just legacy in different directions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tokwase. I wanted to ask you another question, which was, how can we propose projects and initiatives that, impro sorry, that promote inclusive designs within the current framework of our urban landscapes? And I'll probably open that out to both of you, too, if that's okay. So I think that Design happens in, you know, quotidian ways. So I'm interested in the way in which communities cross um, design with the everyday and the ritual, and the way in which those things sort of spill out in the sciences. So I, I, I really get excited when I see um, these moments, whether it's fashion or whether it's painting or sculpture or it's you know, music, where the form has all of those things sort of incorporated, right? We're talking about climate change, but we're also talking about, you know, composition of one's grandmother's hands, or you're talking about what does it mean to be in the wake of something like the transatlantic slave trade. So all of these things um, incorporated together is to really appreciate the quotidian and to understand the bolts that come from the blue, as Glissant says. Like, what, is it, what does it mean to create design um, from all of these histories of movement and um, sharing and inventing and really incorporate the science, the social sciences together to make something new? Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, I, wa I want to agree with that. I resonate deeply with this idea of looking to, listening to rituals of the quotidian. I, I think that's also deeply inspiring for my own practice and my work as well. Um, but I think there's something also about, w when we talk about inclusivity, it's not just about allowing 
allowing others in or allowing everyone in. It's also about thinking deeply from places of difference and asking ourselves how we can be inspired by that difference and how we can create differently from those different ways of being. Um, and just resonating off of what Tokwasa is also saying. And I think that that's, that's something that we have to look at and listen to deeply. Our own voices of difference and the voices of difference around and alongside us as well. Thank you so much, and Hans. Yeah, it's kind of uh, a very big question, and I was actually thinking um, this morning again, I was, because I read every morning Edouard Glisson, right? It's a ritual, uh, and I was actually finding this uh, really wonderful quote in relation to that, which is, you know, Glisson talks about um, the idea of how we can be inclusive uh, and also think about the local. And I think in a way, it's really important, um, this distinction Glissant makes. And Mantia Diabara, uh, who is with us at the Serpentine in so many projects and is of course developing a film um, as we speak, uh, actually, he's shooting this film uh, in Senegal for our Back to Earth project next year. Um, he always says that we need to look at Glissant in terms of question of the local and the inclusive, because he says, that of course the local in relation to architecture and in relation to the, the city is a very important point that it's be, become even more important I think over the last you know 18 months and many discussions circulate around it and Mantia says Glissant teaches us that actually being rooted in a specific context is important but it's only important as long as it doesn't lead to the exclusion of others and of their roots. As it's only important as long as it doesn't lead to the hierarchization and election of some roots and cultures over others. Um, so Glissons teaches us in a way that we need to celebrate roots that expand elsewhere, roots that touch each other, um, and roots, roots that are not singular roots, but roots that cover and roots that protect. And I think that has so much to do with this amazing process we've been able to experience Thanks to Sumaya. So we are really very grateful. Thank you so much, Hans. Um, so the Serpentine Pavilion has a long history of creating groundbreaking architecture. Um, how do you feel about, I mean, we've already touched on how you feel about this particular commission, but how it sits within that history? Yeah, I think it really expanded it um, and it uh, led uh, to, um, uh, an idea of, of listening. I think we've somehow mentioned most of the things. It's led to an expansion also in terms of um, multiple sites um, and a very you know different form of legacy. And of course, I mean, I think it's a little bit like with an exhibition space where always the artists are very aware of what other artists did previously. And I think that has always existed um, with the uh, with the you know with the pavilions. And there have been previous pavilions also which addressed kind of layers of memory. I mean, it was interesting uh, when Sumaya told us for the first time about the scheme, we also remembered the project of, uh, of Herzog de Meuron and, uh, and IBB, because they, of course, also used Cork. That's an interesting parallel. But they had a very different approach, in a way, to memory, because they looked at the memory under the ground, right? They, they wanted to see what kind of traces could be found of previous pavilions and also of, uh, of previous histories, whilst, of course, uh, Sumaya looked at the memory, not only basically of this place here, but looked at the memory of many different communities and of histories which are important. But I think both pavilions are the pavilions which emphasize most uh, the importance of memory. You know? And I mean, we live in a digital age where we have more and more information, but that does, and actually it's in the, in the pavilion here that we discussed that in the memory marathon, that it's not necessarily meaning the fact that we have more information, but we also have more, more memory. So I think th that, that was a connection. Thank you so much, Tukwase. Well, I think that working... So initially when I was sent the model of the pavilion, um, so I was allowing myself with this model so to move through it digitally, just sort of riffing off of what Hans is saying and to think about um, even in this digital form how the computer allowed me to move through different spaces and you know and what happened and I'm really interested in memory and I'm really interested in the brain and I'm really interested in the breath 
So I noticed when um, the inclines happened in the architecture, like what kind of respiratory acts um, that would take. And I imagined um, a sort of respiratory activity, right? Um, when thinking about the, the, the pavilion. So what I hadn't, even though I'd seen pavilions in the past and admired them, this was, I guess, the first time where I've been asked to sort of co collaborate with, with one. And it was exciting to think about, um, and even in my imagination, the acts of sort of rep respiratory conditions, right? So now, because I have that sort of footprint in my own memory, I sort of now pull it up when I'm thinking about um, architecture. So in, in the ways in which it brought me to a new level of sensoria. I think that's a sort of major impact um, for, for me. Thank you so much. And Samaya, are you happy to answer that? Um, I guess it's unfair of me to answer. <laughs> I, did, I, was, I wasn't <laughs> sure if you were. <laughs> but I think just reflecting on, on standing in this incredible legacy of all of these tremendous pavilions which have inspired my own practice and of course been a form of canon for me in so many ways. I had to be very brave and think about what someone like me from my part of the world and with my practice could bring to the pavilion and I really wanted to be able to bring something of my Joburg practice here and um, I've said before that I think Joburg has given me this gift of the desire to want to read things that are happening beneath the surface and draw them out and work with them and amplify them, sharpen them in some way, um, allow, allow them to have space and allow them a generosity of space. And I hope that that's something that this pavilion does. I think it absolutely does. Thank you so much, Maya. And Tokwase, you've been an excellent panel. Can we please have a massive round of applause for them? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, for being <laughs> an excellent audience. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I also wanted to ask for a very special prize for our extraordinary moderator. Hi, everyone. My name is Yomi Adegake and welcome to tonight's second panel, which will be a discussion with the brilliant Sumaya Valley and leading London cultural producers Priya Aluwalia and Eni, hosted by me. So it's unsurprising that the themes of that are central to Sumaya's practice, the conception of the pavilion and to London itself are also central to the work of some of the city's leading creative talent. This panel discussion will provide a window into their world and together we hope to explore how these themes are evident in and have influenced their own creative practices as well as the impact it's had on their lives and their respective journeys. So I would like to welcome to the stage Sumaya Valley, Priya Aluwalia and Eni. Please give them a huge round of applause. Hello again Sumaya. Thank you so much guys. So, Samaya, so I'm going to start with you again. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of belonging. I read in an interview that you said architecture is an extension of who we are and how we recognize ourselves, as well as how we assert our forms of belonging. This sense of having to assert your belonging seems relevant to all forms of creativity, um, but particularly relevant to being part of a minority and living in London. Um, is that something that resonates with you also, Eni, and um, also you, Priya, in terms of your creative journeys? Um, yeah, I think a lot, like where I grew up in South East London, I saw a lot of people that looked like me and there was like a lot of Nigerians. Mm. And so, hey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch, yeah. So I was always familiar with my culture growing up. I always felt like I had a sense of identity because I was surrounded by my aunties and like family members. And so I feel like being placed in a place where there was so much familiarity kind of just helps me be a bit more comfortable growing up. Thank you so much. And is that something that's resonant with you also, Priya? Yeah, I think um, it's similar to any. I'm Indian and Nigerian, and I was in South West London, so just the other side. Um, and I think I had experience of both. So I had experiences where I was in very spaces where no one looked like me, and I realised that that really did 
that wasn't helpful. It wasn't, it wasn't like confirming. It didn't make me feel confident in loads of ways. But when I started to like find my friends and, you know, navigating groups where I was feeling more sim like similar to other people, it really did help me feel more creative and safe to be creative because I felt I could speak something through or do an idea that someone else would be able to understand. So I think it's really important and that's why I think it's important that there's diversity in all spaces. Thank you so much. Um, Samaya, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I think perhaps just reflecting on your quote about architecture um, being also a form of how we assert belonging uh, or forms of belonging, that is why I'm also so interested in forms of ritual and the atmospheres that they create and how those engender belonging because we all are born into architecture and subconsciously it also affirms our place in the world and it tells us who we are and how we need to be treated or how we are recognized. It becomes part of how we also evolve our senses of identity. And if we in inherit a world that is slanted towards a very particular worldview, it also tells us something about our place in that world. And that's why hybridity is so important um, because all of us have pieces of each other inside ourselves. And um, I think both of your works also reflect that. Also just listening to the diversity of your own backgrounds um, is so inspiring because it's very visible in your work. And I, I think it's also inspiring for architects to be able to look at and listen to um, and think through how we can also manifest that in our built world. Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, something that you've all already kind of touched on is the idea of sort of community and communities. Um, Any, how would you personally define your community and how would you say your community has influenced and shaped your work? Um, I think my community has shaped my work as in it's just kind of made me who I kind of am. I was like a really sheltered child, so I was always surrounded by like just family and just like, familiar faces so if it's like my mum's friend I know I'm safe because that's somebody I know and so just having again like that network as like a, a seven-year-old I think is important and just to see like black women also just in positions of like leadership because that's something that was I was constantly reinforced like in a dance group I was in was run by a black woman there was a youth center that I was involved in was run by a black woman so then again you just being able to see people that look like me and yeah. Thank you so much, Eni. Priya? Um, yeah, community to me means a lot of different things. I've got, for people that don't know, which is probably most of you, I've got a brand called Adawalia and um, through that... <laughs> a lot of people do know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I always find that weird. Um, through that brand, I guess there's community in so many different ways. So it's like my team is a community and like who I pick to work with, whether that's inside the studio or the photographers and stylists we work with or there's the communities that I'm inspired by and that's constantly, you know, comes from my dual heritage and going back to India, going back to Nigeria, obviously mainly when there's not a pandemic. Um, but like being in touch with the communities that I, I'm from and getting their insights and that can feed itself in so many different ways. It could be techniques of craftsmanship, so it's like embroidery from India, but it also can be from just stories and experiences. And so I think that it fe feeds into work so many different ways. It could be like the smell of a certain party or a wedding or a when I'm in India that can remind me of something or the colour of the sand in Nigeria reminds me of something else and all those different things that I'm constantly surrounding myself with community feeds into the work so I think it's it's it can be like the local or like your community that's right next to you or it can be the one that's wider that you're reaching for longing for or even missing so I think yeah it comes in different ways. Thank you so much. Um, Samaya would you like to add to that? I think the word community is uh, quite fraught in itself and also highly contested. Um, and I, 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 I guess I want to also resonate with, um, with what Annie and Priya are, also are saying in terms of developing an expanded idea and sense of what community is and can be. Um, and again, just to touch on and talk about hybridity, which I think we're all working to express in our works, there is something really powerful in being able to open dialogue and conversation and reach many different communities in being able to be hybrid um, and in being able to resonate with many different different kinds of people and different different realms whether that is um, cultural realms or it's 
thinking through how we overlap in terms of our discipline and so on. And, and that's something that I thought deeply about in this pavilion. It's not just about being able to bring a diversity of voices um, in terms of where people come from or what they look like. It's also about bringing diversity of thought. And as Tokwase said, uh, friendship and the network that we've created through it is also a very important part of what it is and what it stands for, that it's been able to engender and hopefully evolve a kind of community of thought um, in itself. Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, so the pavilion was conceived as a place for people to gather um, and draws inspiration from other places of gathering. Um, and I think my favourite element is the fact that it has the four other structures embedded within the city. Um, the Tabernacle in Notting Hill, um, which is the headquarters for Carnival, New Beacon Books, a place that's, you know, especially close to my heart in Finsbury Park, the Albany in Deptford and the new Beckon Tree Forever Arts and Culture Hub um, at Valence Library in Barking and Dagenham. Um, COVID made gathering essentially impossible. Um, how would you say that's made you reappraise and reevaluate the importance of people being able to come together and commune? Um, I think it's absolutely for me as you've said, we appraised uh, the importance of physical spaces and physical architectures um, and the importance of being able to have public spaces with dignity where people can come together and gather um, and convene. And I think that all of us have missed so much of this, of being able to be in physical space, being able to have spontaneous interactions with other people who we might not know um, and getting to meet people, encounter uh, difference in many different forms. Um, and that it, it, that's something I think that was absolutely um, reinforced for me during COVID because I started to realize my own reliance on physical spaces, physical energy and the city. And isn't it wonderful also that we're ending the life of this pavilion with this beautiful gathering of all of you here. Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, Priya, how would you answer that? Especially, you've already mentioned that, you know, you, COVID has, as it has with everyone, affected your ability to travel to Nigeria, to travel to um, India. How would you say the pandemic has made you rethink the importance of physical space? Um, I think I tried to be positive about it. And I think that there was loads of opportunities I, I had or I created because of the pandemic. So where I was, there was an absence of human connection and being able to physically interact. Like I really explored the medium of film and that's something I don't know if I would have, Any was in one of my films. Um, I don't know if I would have necessarily like explored that with, with, with being forced to not do live events and things like that. So there was those positive sides to it, but really I don't think that there's anything like human connection and also like in, excitement and build up and enthusiasm and the energy that can come from connecting in real life so you know i know that there's those of talk about like it's good that we're reducing our flights and things like that which is great but there is still nothing like connecting back to someone or some place and so um i hope but well, i just think i just appreciate it all much more now so any chance i've got to connect with someone on a human level or go back to a particular place i think it's even more special to me so yeah I'm going to, I'm very happy that we can start to go back to it. Thank you so much, Priya. Any, um, that must have obviously affected you in a huge way, you know, music, um, live gigs and, um, you know, that, that physical communion and that space. Um, have you sort of rethought how important that is in light of the pandemic? No, definitely. Um, because of the studio I work out of in Dawson, it's in this like building called the Total Refreshment Centre. And there's a studio there called Route 73. And it was like prior to the pandemic, they were like hosting events and everyone was like vibing and making music. You'd go into the studio, people were coming in and out and then like suddenly we're in lockdown. And I think everyone that used to come to the studio felt it. And it was like, you'd find that sometimes people would like sneak into the studio, but no one would be there. And it's just like, it wasn't something that we realized we missed until it was taken away, just linking up and just like mixing energy with people just as you're passing. And so, as things have opened back now, you kind of really appreciate it. So like going there like every Thursday or every Friday and you're starting to see everyone back again and everyone looks happy and everyone's like creating. I think it's very important because art is like a, is a very like community driven thing as well. I think we're all inspired by one another. So when 
you're kind of taken away from that and then you're put back in it, it's like you're able to like develop your art again. And I think it's sick. So that's what's been the sickest thing about linking up with people again, I think. Thank you so much, Henny. Um, and you've already mentioned one of the spaces that held a particular significance for you as someone growing up in this, um, who has grown up in the city, the studio. Um, but I want to broaden this question out. Um, as people who've grown up in the city, or in Samaya's case, you live in the city, of course, you grew up in South Africa, but you are very much a part of this city. Um, what are the places that did hold that significance for you? Because as you mentioned, you don't really necessarily miss something until it's taken away. So let's start with Priya, if that's okay. Um, actually, it's funny that you were talking about the tabernacle and this being a part of it, because um, the tabernacle and anything to do with carnival is really dear to me. I've been every year since I was two. And um, the tabernacle was one of the locations in my first film, Joy. We were celebrating the unique like, black British experience and what that looks like across a kaleidoscope of people. So that area of carnival is really special to me. But also um, Southall, which I don't know that many people that are even from London go to. It's a really special Punjabi community. It's the first and biggest one in the, in the UK. And it's like northwest London, and um, you know you can get really authentic food, outfits, everything. So that's a really special place to me. And also, it was really hard when Tooting closed down because hair, nails, eyebrows, everything was going on there. So <laughs> that was hard as well. And the food. <laughs> Thank you so much, Priya. Um, any? What other spaces aside from the studio? Um, I think eating out and well I'm kind of an introvert so I would like being in my house anyways so <laughs> um but yeah I think the studio and just being able to like just have that freedom of just being able to that freedom that we all kind of lost I think was one of the most important things and like even in a religious space like just being able to go to church and be around other people I think that was like a different experience because now you're at home and all you see is like numbers i think that was the biggest thing i took away that everything kind of became figures and not like physical people and so trying to differentiate that like you see all these people here but online it would be like there's 118 people in this room and so just yeah that thank you so much smile um i grew up in a very small community in south africa it's called lodium and um it's an apartheid township, which meant that it was Indian only. Um, even though I grew up at the demise of apartheid, it still reflected that because people's socioeconomic backgrounds don't change overnight. But there were many, um, many things that I remember. I, I still have a very close relationship to Lodium. My parents still live there. Um, and I, I, I think for me, something that I carry in my practice is the value of interstitial spaces that can be used for ritual, um, whether that's the street in the form of how people make lives and livelihoods or come together to share a meal or play. Um, the generosity of that space, I think, is something that sticks with me. And also how um, people have been able to find ways to make something positive out of something that's meant to be segregatory. So uh, how um, walls, for example, are used in neighborhoods as spaces to share rather than spaces to keep people apart or how um, stairs between neighbors also start to become connecting spaces. Um, and I remember also the spaces outside the mosque that I went to when I was a child uh, during Ramadan, how that would be used for um, kids to play soccer or other interstitial activities to take place and happen and those spaces are very important because they allow us again to encounter people um, unlike ourselves even if it is within our own communities that they are places where you know we as I said in the beginning find ways to assert and evolve our identities and they affirm us but they also tell us something about who we are and we start to become in dialogue with them. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, so a key influence to your work and your pavilion um, is migration and how, I love this quote, London is a ex place of extreme hybridity. Everyone is both an insider and an outsider. Um, how do you see yourself and your work relating to that? Um, I'm going to start with you, Priya. Um, yeah, what do you... Um, <clears throat> I think that's quite a big question for me because it really does that is like the starting point of my whole work, I guess. Um, it's constant, I'm constantly looking at like, 
what happens to us as people as we go from generation to generation, moving around the world. You know, there's a loss of culture, there's a gain of culture, there's a loss of language, there's a gain of language. And, you know, even looking at my own family history, I'm from two different places in the world, and if my mum and dad didn't go to a nightclub in the 90s, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> thinking about all these, like, funny, quirky things as well that happens with it. And it really does feed into all my work. I'm, I'm like, constantly inspired by, you know, like, it's really funny because I'm 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 Indian, but I'm an I'm a mixed race India Indian person in London. And when I speak to my cousins that live in India, our experience of being Indian is so different. Um, my experience of being Nigerian compared to people that are are just fully Nigerian is so different. So all of those nuances and experiences they all feed into my work. So I'm const it's 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 I almost don't know how to answer because it's literally. So I integral. guess what I'm doing, and it's so integral. I, you know, there's uh, one collection I did, for example, was inspired by the book Homegoing by Yar Jassy, and that's a tale of two sisters that were born in 1800s Ghana, and the book follows each of their children, generation down generation, and it just shows like what decisions in your family can affect the next generation. So, I'm constantly looking for stories about movement around the world and and what that means, and it could be something you know it could be sometimes i'm looking at infographics um and data or another time it could be like literally you know looking at times of syncretism like the harlem renaissance where it was a big cultural period for black and american culture to come together so it yeah it, i i'm rambling because i've got too much to say but i'll wrap it up there <laughs> it's never a bad thing <laughs> thank you so much for your um any um i think like personally for myself, I feel like I'm always going to be an insider and an outsider. Like I know growing up, I knew I was Nigerian and then kind of like being surrounded by Nigerian family and they'd be like, like, can you speak the tongue? And you're like, no, I can't speak the tongue. And then they're like, oh, well, you're, you're like, you're not Nigerian. And so like, I had this like period for a long time where I was, I felt like, oh, like, what am I? And then I kind of just realized that like, there's a lot of us here. I think also that again, with the community thing that because there's so many young black Nigerian people here that were also British. There's also this like, it's like a dichotomy of culture. So you're like, or a hybrid. And so you're like Nigerian because you, in your house it's Nigerian, but then you're outside and it's like, it's different. And so it's just kind of merging both of those cultures to make something different, but just understanding that home is both places at the end of the day and just kind of keep that same identity, because that's what you're going to kind of pass on to your children. If I have a child back in Nigeria, there's still traits of Britishness that I'm going to take. And if I have a child here, there's still going to be a whole lot of culture as a Nigerian I'm going to be able to give to them. So I think, yeah, it's just embracing the not fitting in, but also the fitting in. Thank you so much, Samaya. I think it's a deep strength, and I'm just reflecting on what Priya and Eni are saying about the strength of being hybrid and the strength of always being, of always moving and being evolving. And um, I think this sounds big, but I, I often also say that the future is African or the future is other, the future is Southern, because there is so much in those ways of being and our ways of being that is open to shift and open to evolution, open to mutation in, when Priya was talking about data and the digital also, I think those ways of being have so much synergy with things that are um, ephemeral, that are evolving, that are not focused on petrifying or staticizing or labeling or categorizing. Um, and so the condition of being an insider and an outsider, which I think is a condition that we all embody, is also um, at the heart of, it's, it's anticipating the future, it's at the heart of what it is to be in the future. Um, and if anything, I think all of the categories and binaries and silos that we've created and this world to essentialize things is not only deeply dangerous, but also deeply unproductive. Um, and this condition of being an insider and an outsider is glorious and one of my favourite things about London is that anybody can be from here. Yes, round of applause. Thank you so much, Samaya. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'd like you all, if possible, to answer this. Um, one of the things that's amazing about all of your work is that um, your art forms are socially conscious, creative expressions. Um, what would you say your hopes are for a more equitable future? Um, let's start with you, Smile. Free decolonized education. 
yes. Sorry, can we have a round of applause for that as well? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is that mic drop? Thank you very much. <laughs> Any <What's the> question? <laughs> no. Do not worry. I do this on every panel. I very often. Um, so, what would you say your hopes are for a more sort of equitable or equal or fair, essentially, future in society? Oh, um, like Priya helped me with this to be fair, just to see more people of a, like that look like me in higher spaces. I think we need more of us in the rooms. And so, yeah. Thank you so much. And Priya. Um, yeah, a little bit of what Anise says as well. Um, and what Samaya says, definitely um, decolonise spaces in all levels. So whether it's education, workplaces, public transport, everywhere. Um, that really needs to happen. But also, for me, a real respect... Because, yes, we're all in London, right? And it's very fine and well that if in our London companies we start to see more diversity going up and up and up. But actually, for me, we operate on a global stage. And, like, most businesses that we all work in, we source from somewhere else. We're, like, dumping things somewhere else. Not me, but some people. Um, <laughs> not me. <laughs> like, we're selling somewhere else. And for me, the real, real like the change will be when we start to respect people that are from a, a border that we've made up and I think exp respecting environments so you know not not dumping toxic waste in east east like uh, eastern europe or not dumping our second hand clothing in west africa I think when we start to really treat people globally as a human being on an equal level that to me will be true what a great point to end on can we yeah can we get a round of applause for that and also for our excellent panelists please Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys have been incredible. Thank you. Um, thank you for being an excellent audience. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I have. It was phenomenal. Thanks so much, girls. Thank you.